Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for coming. I'm going to tell you a story today about the relationship between two programming languages. Alda is a text-based music composition language. And Clojure, as you may know, is a functional programming-oriented Lisp that runs on the JVM. But first, some introductions are in order. Hi, I'm Dave. I studied music composition and bassoon performance. And then there was a six-year peri period of my life where I kind of fell into a government job that had nothing to do with music or programming. But I was uh, dabbling in programming at the time. And uh, at some point, I got the crazy idea to combine my interests of music and programming. And out of that emerged Alda, which I'll talk about in a couple of slides. Since 2014, I've been working as a software engineer at Adzerk, which has been greatly rewarding. I would like to talk a little bit more about that, because we're hiring. We have a booth upstairs. Uh, please come say hi if, you're, if what I'm about to say is interesting to you. Uh, we're a world-class uh, world platform for decision-making at scale. You can use our ad-serving APIs to build your own fully custom ad-serving platform in a matter of weeks. We get to do a lot of Clojure there, which I really enjoy. Clojure is my favorite programming language, um, among other, th other things. Um, and it's a smallish company. We're a fully remote team of about 30 people. Uh, roughly 10 engineers, and we're looking to grow. Uh, so come find me on Slack or after the talk, or come talk to us upstairs. So here's the elevator pitch for Alda. Alda is a text format for expressing a music composition. Imagine if you could write music by writing and editing text in a text file in your editor of choice. And imagine if you had a command line client that you could use to interpret and perform your score. And then, as a bonus, imagine if that were integrated into your text editor of choice, so that you could highlight some text and press a couple of keys and hear what your, the music that you're writing uh, played back to you. This is the sort of tight feedback loop that we love as programmers. And that's the sort of experience that I wanted to bring to music composition. As a bit of context, this is the sort of environment that I was composing music in uh, all through college and for a little while afterwards. Um, this is Sibelius, which is an industry standard for music composition. Many professional composers use Sibelius um, and other programs like it. There's another one called Finale. Uh, and these are highly visual, mouse-oriented like environments for composing music. You, um, you know, there are keyboard shortcuts that if you spend enough time with the software, you can learn them. But by and large, you are dragging things around on the screen, trying to pinpoint just the right line or space on the staff for the note that you want to set down, um, or hunting through menus and panels to try to find the symbol that you'd like to place on your score. And this worked fine for me at the time. Um, I didn't know too much about programming or software development. And I didn't realize that there was a problem there until I got more into software development and discovered the efficiency of working at the command line. Um, this is the sort of environment that I, that I find cumbersome, because you want to express an idea that you have in your head. Maybe you've, uh, you have your guitar out, or you're, you're at a piano, or you're playing around with your whatever instrument that you, that you play that you're working with to help you compose music. And you just want to notate that. Sometimes it takes quite a long time to notate the idea that you have in your head, because it's quite complex. So there's this trap that you end up falling into when you spend a lot of time with software like this. My composition professor warned me against this, um, which is that if you, if you lean too heavily on this, on this sort of software, um, which you can, you, you can use to play back what you've, what you've written, there's a play button, or you can press the space bar and hear what you've written uh, right directly afterwards, um, you kind of end up writing more music that's more simplistic and repetitive, because it's, it can be so difficult sometimes to notate the idea you have that you'll settle for something that's sort of half-formed. And maybe it sounds OK to you, so you'll copy and paste it a bunch of times. So this is really creatively limiting. So the idea that I've been exploring is a terminal user interface for music composition. Uh, by contrast, this is keyboard-oriented. I'm able to maintain focus because I'm not looking through menus or trying to visually lay out my score. Rather, I have an idea in my head, and I, I kind of know the notes that I want to um, write. And I'll write them. Maybe I've gotten one of the notes slightly wrong. I've forgotten an accidental or something. Um, but I can highlight what I want to play and press a couple of keystrokes. I'll hear that it's slightly wrong, and I can correct it. So I find this sort of workflow very efficient and very liberating. Before I go much further, I'd like to give you just a quick demo of Alda. 
And I have a note for myself here that time is of the essence. I can't spend a whole lot of time on this demo. Um, I have given a couple of talks in the past where I've gone into more detail um, and given a sort of gentle introduction uh, to Alda and its various features and how to use them to get up and running and start writing scores. So I'd encourage you to check those out if um, what I'm showing you here is intriguing to you. Uh, but I'm not going to give you the gentle introduction here. I'm just going to throw you in the deep end. This is a transcription of an excerpt of a string quartet by Debussy. And before I say anything about it, I'm just going to play it. So I'll give you a couple brief mentions of some syntax here. Um, uh, at a high level, the score, is, the score consists of four instrument parts. There are two violins, which I've nicknamed violin one and violin two. There's a viola part, and there's a cello part, and they're playing music concurrently. And we begin each part by specifying what octave we are in. Cello is an octave two, viola is an octave three, violin two is also an octave three, violin one is an octave four. Uh, a note is simply a letter followed by, uh, optionally followed by a note length, like a quarter note. This is a G quarter note. And this is an F quarter note tied to an eighth note. And we have various other things that I don't have time to go into right now. Um, minuses and pluses are flats and sharps. And um, you, you may also notice that there's some par uh, parenthetical expressions sort of littered, at, littered throughout the score. And if you're a closure programmer, perhaps this one looks a little bit interesting to you. Maybe it looks a little familiar. This is actually a closure, uh, a snippet of closure code, a closure expression. The Alda runtime is written in closure, and we expose evaluation semantics so that you can, uh, it gives you a sort of an inline Lisp scripting layer, if you will. Here's a simpler example. So Alda is basically two languages in one. There's this markup style that I've talked uh, real briefly about, um, where you have syntactic elements that represent things directly. Um, like we're saying here, this is a piano part, and it's an octave four, and we have these four notes in a chord. But you can also express anything that you could express in markup with closure code. There's a DSL that's built into the, your evaluation context that gives you useful functions like chord and note and pitch. So why is this useful? Well, we have the full power of closure at our disposal because we're literally just evaluating code within a context. And anybody who spent some time with closure can tell you that closure has a wonderful standard library consisting of many useful functions out of the box. I'm still discovering new closure functions every day that I didn't know existed in the, the closure core namespace. And there are a number of useful functions for dealing with sequences, which translates nicely into managing sequences of notes. So I can do things like define a function that will return n random notes. And then I can say, give me four random notes and then repeat this phrase. And this, uh, this is the closure syntax intermingled with the markup syntax. This is fun because every time you evaluate it, you get different notes. And from there, you can continue, continue to experiment and play with the closure programming language and see what you can do with these sequences of notes. Um, here's an example where if you use closures iterate and rest functions together, um, in this example, we have a sequence of 16 random notes and then we're going to iterate the rest function over that. So next we have a sequence of just the last 15 notes. And then we'll have a sequence of the last 14 notes. And these all get spliced together. So you get this repeating pattern that gets shorter every time you hear it. That concludes that demo. <laughs> Thanks.
So the main thing that I want to um, drive home about this demo is that uh, closure is sort of uh, a, you know, sort of uh, a subset of ALDA. It's sort of like cohabitating within the ALDA language as um, part of the language, which is something that will change over time. So keep that in the back of your mind. At this point, I would like to talk about architecture. I'll talk about how um, I've gone through several different phases of how I've put together the pieces in ALDA, and we'll see how closure plays a role in each of those. Around 2013, when I first implemented ALDA in Clojure, it was just a single Clojure program. And that was the quickest way that I could get to something that I could play around with. So you use this command line uh, client to, to say, hey, play, play these three notes on a piano. And then this Clojure program will parse the, synth the code. It'll build up a score object in memory as a data structure. And it'll, it will perform that data structure as music. So this got me up, up and running. But there are a couple of problems. For one thing, Clojure is notorious for having a long startup time, which makes it unsuitable for writing command line applications if you care about how fast um, that, that program can run. Um, sometimes it's on the order of several seconds. So you'll issue a command, and then a few seconds later, the program will run. And that was fine for, at first, but the more I played with it, the more I wanted just even more immediate feedback. I wanted to, you know, within milliseconds, I wanted to hear the music that I was writing. Another problem um, that I discovered as I was playing around with this initial prototype is that this uh, workflow was synchronous. I would play a score, and then I would not regain control of my terminal until the score was finished playing. So um, I began to feel like I wanted to play a score, and then I would, I would kind of pick something out. My ear would hear something that didn't sound quite right, or I wanted to tweak it. And so I immediately wanted to hit that up arrow and, uh, and edit that command. Uh, so I started thinking about a more asynchronous interface. So those problems informed phase two. Um, and this was also kind of early on in my career as a software developer. So I wasn't really quite aware about interprocess communication mechanisms. So I went with the only thing that I knew how to build, which is an HTTP server. And I pulled out um, just the part that talks to the HTTP server. So we have this client that's now written in Java, which is great because it starts up quickly. It's cross-platform, so I can easily create an ALDA for, um, for Linux and Mac OS users and ALDA.exe for Windows users um, with the closure part bundled in. And so the workflow is that you, you, you run ALDA up to start your server. And that spawns a new process in the background that's running this closure server. And that server is just going to sit there and wait for input from you. And so then you'll say, hey, Alda, play these three notes on a piano. And you'll hear the result immediately. The server is doing all of the work. So this solved the problem for me of this closure startup time, where I wanted to hear the result immediately. And it solved the issue of playback being synchronous. But there's a new problem. Someone pointed out to me that, hey, HTTP is a little bit overkill if all you want to do is inter-process communication. It turns out that there's all this overhead that comes with HTTP. You have to parse headers. Uh, there's, there's all these subtleties of the format. Um, and if you're picking up an HTTP server library off the shelf, chances are it's, it's starting a, a pool of threads that are going to handle these requests. Maybe all you need is one thread. So uh, a contributor to Alda early on pointed out that there are other ways to do this. And so this led to the phase three. There's also another problem, which I'm going to skim over right now because I did not solve it in phase three. So phase three, this is actually exactly the same architecture. There's still just a server process in the background and a Java client that talks to the server. But I replaced the, uh, the communication with 0MQ. What is 0MQ? It is a uh, message protocol for distributed messaging. Um, it's quite handy. There are a, a variety of libraries for 0MQ in uh, a bunch of different languages. So you can use it to talk back and forth between programs that are written in different languages. It's a very simple protocol. Um, essentially, it's just byte arrays with, with frames. And uh, it uses the same ab abstractions for if you're talking between multiple threads in a single process, or if you're talking between multiple processes on a single machine, or if you're communicating between multiple nodes on a server you have the same abstractions that you can work with. 
And I like to think of zero MQ as being sort of like working with sockets directly, except that it's really difficult to do that. So zero MQ does a lot of um, kind of housekeeping for you behind the scenes. There are various patterns that you can uh, achieve by uh, plumbing together different types of sockets. So here's a very simple example of um, a, a program you might write using zero MQ. And the neat thing here is that the client and the server here could be th um, threads in a single program, or they could be multiple programs being run across the world from each other. It doesn't matter. Each program, um, or, or each thread, uh, creates an instance of a zero MQ socket that has a particular type. So the client has a request socket, and the server has a response socket. And all that's happening here is that the client is using that socket to send a, uh, an array of bytes to the server. And the server um, has a knowledge through the, uh, through the zero MQ library. It has a sort of implicit knowledge of where that message came from. And so it just is listening for messages and responding to them. And a byte array goes back to the client. It's simple. Um, so this solved the issue of uh, HTTP being overkill for IPC. And I still had this problem that I glossed over before, which is that I was starting to notice that uh, if I played a score too close together, if I was maybe trying to iterate on something I was writing, and I played something back to back too quickly, or if I played two scores at the same time for some crazy reason, the audio would glitch out and go crazy. Um, the reason for that is that I'm using uh, the, the Java, there's actually a built-in synthesizer, a MIDI synthesizer in the JVM. And it, it just so happens that if you have multiple instances of that synthesizer in a single process, they don't play nicely together. I suppose that they're both trying to get too greedy with resources. So uh, I was able to use zero MQ to make things a little bit more complicated, but achieve um, having playback happen in multiple processes. So you notice things are starting to get a little bit more complex in the architecture diagram here. Um, so now we have these worker processes that are just the sort of the business logic pulled out of the server. These worker processes are parsing code, evaluating that code, and performing your score for you. So now the server has a, a different role. Now its job is to spawn and supervise these worker processes. And its job is to receive requests from a client and find a worker that's available and hand that request to the worker. And then when the worker's done, it will hand the request back to the client. So this is kind of nice because the client doesn't really need to worry about the worker processes. All it cares about is where the server is, how it can talk to the server. It's running on a particular port. And it receives a message, it receives a response back to the request. So let's revisit our problems. Um, but first, let's look at the zero MQ uh, architecture diagram. Um, so this is, uh, instead of request and response sockets, the semantics are slightly different. So we have a combination of socket types called dealer and router. And basically the idea is that you have, uh, you have parties on either side of the, of the transaction here. Of the, you think of this as a sort of business transaction. So the, your dealers are the client and the worker processes. And the server is just uh, functioning as a go-between or a broker. So a message comes in from the client. The server finds an available worker and routes the request to the worker. The worker sends a response back to the server. And the server will route that request back to the client. I was surprised how easy it was to build something like this with zero MQ. So let's revisit our problems. This fixed the issue of the audio glitching, which is great. Um, but there's sort of a side effect that emerged, with this, which is that uh, th this architecture is getting a bit complex at this point. Um, I started running into issues. Uh, I, some people reported issues where they would start the server, and the server would say, OK, I'm up. Now I'm starting the worker processes. And then it would just hang there forever. We're like, what's, what's going on there? Um, apparently, the server was having issues starting um, background processes of its own. Uh, perhaps certain operating systems, like maybe Windows um, operating systems, certain versions of Windows, um, don't let background processes start their own background processes. And this is very difficult for me to debug without having somebody's computer sitting in front of me. Um, so I, I started wanting to simplify things a little bit. Another issue is that this workflow, um, since phase two, when I introduced the server to begin with, uh, the user now needs to worry about having a server up and running. This doesn't work like it does in a lot of other, um, you know, a lot of other compilers or interpreters. Like if you fire up Ruby, uh, you're not needing to start a Ruby server to get work done. So I kind of wanted to solve that problem. 
Another issue is that there's a finite number of workers. Usually there's two by default because that's often as many as you need. But even if you have more, there's still this problem where if you're doing work too quickly and, and firing off too many requests, um, if all of the workers are busy, then there's no worker available to take your request and the server just tells you, uh, try again later, all the workers are busy. So that's not a great user experience. So with all these things in mind, I started to put together a wish list of the way I wanted all this to work in the next major version. I wanted to move most of the functionality into the client. I wanted to do away with this idea of having background processes that the end user has to care about and just make it a nicer experience. But at the same time, I did want to have a background uh, thread or process for, for playing your scores because I wanted to maintain that asynchronous workflow where you can say, play something, and then immediately regain control of your terminal. So I wanted to have, um, I started thinking, thinking about having a, a process that does nothing except for just the playback bit. Um, because I was moving most of the functionality into the client, I would have to address that initial problem that I ran into in phase one, which is that the closure runtime takes a while to bootstrap. So I started thinking about maybe there's a way that I can generate native executables or just get things running faster, closer to the metal. And there's also another thing that I wanted to add in, which is completely orthogonal to everything I've mentioned so far, so bear with me. But I want to support live coding. I want you to be able to play a score, and maybe, you're, maybe the score is that you want to play a pattern forever. And then while that pattern's playing, I want you to be able to come back and say, okay, that score you're playing, change it a little bit. Let's maybe change the notes. And you'll hear that update the next time the pattern loops through. So these are all things that I was thinking about. And here's the, the phase five architecture that I came up with. Um, so this is a lot simpler, less to worry about. Uh, it's almost like the phase one architecture in that you just have a client and you're saying, hey, do this. And the Alda client will do most of the work of parsing, this, the, parsing your code, building up a score object in memory. Um, when it comes to playback, the, the client has transparently started a process in the background to use for playback. And the client will then communicate with that player process by sending OSC messages. So I decided to change the transport from 0MQ to OSC, which is called, it's, a, it's open sound control. OSC is the de facto standard for communication between computers and synthesizers uh, and various other music software and multimedia devices. You can use it to control lights. Uh, a lot of cool applications for OSC. The transport is UDP, which is great because it's low latency. It's uh, ideally suited for live audio and video applications. So the more I thought about it, the more I thought that OSC would be a good fit for Alda. And it's, um, it's very easy to get up and running with OSC. There are libraries for a bunch of different languages. Uh, the message structure is simple. It's open-ended. You basically have two parts. There's the address, which can have patterns in it. So the, the OSC listener can listen for these messages and extract the data it needs from the, the address part. So in this case, we're sending a message that um, is supposed to play a MIDI note on track one. And then the rest of the message is parameters. And in this case, uh, these are all numbers, but there are a variety of different types of parameters that are supported by most OSC libraries, like strings, characters, MIDI messages, uh, blobs of binary data, and you can, you can even define your own custom data types, which is very useful. So I'm gonna go back to this phase five diagram, and you may have noticed something subtle that I've left out, which is that I left out any uh, programming language logos. And the reason for that is that I, I was sort of saving a shocking revelation for this slide. Um, you may be surprised to hear that I've switched out the implementation from Clojure to Go and Kotlin. Yeah, gasp. Um, this, this will particularly come as a shock to you if you know how much I love closure. You know, what am I doing here? Uh, but the reason for that is really that, you know, for the reasons I listed in the, the previous slide, um, I wanted to create native executables so I can get really close to the metal with performance. I wanted the client to do all of the work. And uh, it's, it's also important to me to generate uh, executables that are, you can just, whatever your operating system is, whatever your architecture is, you can just download the release from GitHub, put it somewhere on your path, and it will work. And out of the options I tried, which included Go and Rust and Crystal, uh, Go was the only one where I could easily uh, do that with the, the, with the executables being totally devoid of dynamic linking. So no native libraries required. 
And um, it was interesting coming to Go from Clojure because Go is um, a, a bit limiting uh, from, my, from my perspective as a Clojure programmer. Uh, it, it was a bit of a, a culture shock coming into it. Um, but the more I worked with Go, the more I sort of started to view, uh, view the limitations as an asset. It's actually kind of nice um, being limited sometimes because it makes your, your code easy to read. It's very easy to reason about something if there's only one way you can do it. Um, right. So. This is where Clojure fits into the picture now. It's very important to me that I be able to continue to write algorithmic music in Clojure. And I had to find a way to do that. And I actually found that this is a better place in the diagram for Clojure to fit. Because now I have complete control of uh, a Clojure process. Maybe I can write a Clojure program that, that drives Alda and does exactly what I want to do with it. So I was able to get this running. Uh, to, get to, to get this workflow working by writing this library for Clojure called Alda CLJ. It is a Clojure library for live coding music with Alda. And what it's doing is really pretty simple. You, you have the same sort of musical DSL that I showed you earlier in, in the previous demo, where you have functions like note and chord. And um, under the hood, Alda CLJ is generating a string of Alda, uh, valid Alda syntax, that gets sent to the Alda command line client. So I'm going to demo that for you now. OK, so uh, the library is really one namespace, alda.core, that has all of the useful functions in it. And one of the functions that you get is alda. This basically just lets you shell out to the command line client. So you can do things like get the version or check the status of the worker processes. Um, and as you can see, you have the same DSL for working with your musical score. And when you, when you call this function, it not only sends the, the Alda code to the command line client, it will also return the string of code so you can kind of see what you're doing. And you know, I'm just, I have a, a closure REPL running in the background that I'm connected to, so I'm in control of this process. Um, so of course, it stands to reason that I have the closure standard library available to me. So I can continue to do interesting things with sequences. Um, so here's sort of a basic example where I have notes from C, D, E, F, and G. And then I'm just injecting rests in between them. You can see this in the, the Alda code, C, rest, D, rest, E, rest. And of course, I can leverage randomness, which is always fun. I always think it's fun to generate random sequences of notes with random rhythms and random pitches. Because when I listen back to that, I kind of, my ear picks up on little things that sound interesting to me. And then I can go, go to a piano or pick up my guitar and try to figure out what the notes are and compose something interesting with it. Um, so I've used this to create uh, pieces of algorithmic music. Um, here's one where I've defined a function that returns a random note that um, has a random pitch and a random duration, or it might choose to rest for a certain amount of time. And then I just say, you know, I've got, three, I've got these three parts, an electric piano, a timpani, and a celeste. And I just want each of those to invoke this function 50 times to figure out what, what part it's going to play. sounds emerge from that. Uh, the last thing I'm going to show you is a piece that I wrote specifically for this conference. And I wanted to demonstrate that you can use external closure libraries um, when you're using the Alda CLJ library. So in this case, I'm pulling in an HTTP client and a, a JSON library. And I'm, uh, what I'm doing is I'm pulling weather data from the National Weather Service API. Uh, let's try to memorize these, these instruments. So New York is percussion. LA is an upright bass. St. Louis is a tenor sax. And Durham, where I'm from, is a vibraphone. Maybe I'll, I'll show that while I'm playing the score so we can keep it in our heads. Um, so I'm hitting the API. And I'm getting, um, when, what, what you get back is a list of 15 data points for the next 15 hour windows in a particular city or at a particular uh, set of coordinates. 
And so, you know, this is most of the code. I'm just getting, I'm fetching that forecast, I'm reading it, um, reading the JSON, grabbing the forecast data out of it, and um, that's, that's about it. Uh, and then once I have that data in hand, I am doing this. Uh, so uh, I'm using various data, various um, bits of information from these forecasting periods. Uh, the temperature, I'm using verbatim as the MIDI note number. So MIDI note numbers go from zero to 127. So these are sort of in the upper mid range, uh, but I'm also adjusting the octave so that, for example, the upright bass sounds lower. Uh, the wind direction affects the panning. So assuming that stereo works in here, you might hear the, the instruments moving from left to right or vice versa, depending on which direction the wind is blowing. And the wind speed affects how fast the notes are coming at you as well as how loud they're coming at you. So if you hear notes getting louder and uh, faster, that means that the wind is picking up in that city. So without further ado, hopefully this will work. Seems like New York is usually pretty windy. Notice that the tenor sax sounds kind of high pitched. It's because it's been hot lately, as we're all aware. <laughs> so anyway, you get the idea. <laughs> That's all I've got. Looks like I've got about about eight minutes left. Thank you. <laughs> so I have some time left for questions. Yes. Yeah. The question was, have you considered uh, using this on the data from the recent hurricane? Yes. A hurricane came through North Carolina, where I'm from. And uh, it, it sounded about like you would expect. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of fast notes coming at you. Yes, in the back. In phase five, uh, so I'm still using, um, I'll, I'll uh, put that di uh, diagram back up. So I'm using Kotlin on the player side. So this is still a JVM process. Yes. The question is, is the similarity between Alda syntax and Lily Pond syntax accidental? Absolutely not. I definitely stole a bunch of ideas from Lily Pond. Another big uh, inspiration for the syntax was uh, music macro language, or MML, which is, you might know this if you had a flip phone and uh, you programmed ringtones into it. It's kind of a similar syntax to that. Yes. Uh, I'm, I have that sort of working on a branch. Uh, the, the current release is still the uh, phase four architecture, actually. Yes? Um, when you move to this last architecture, how do you have the closure embedded in all the shows or things in all the... Yeah, that's a good question. The question was, uh, in phase five, since closure has now been pulled out and is not a part of the player process or the client, um, how do I maintain that, that closure syntax? Um, and the, the fact is I had to make a breaking change there. Uh, th there's actually still a Lisp in Alda v2, which is implemented in Go, and it's, uh, it's, it's sort of a, I think of it as like a dumb Lisp. Like you can't really do much with it. It doesn't have macros. It's basically, right now, it's just a way to invoke functions, and everything is built in. But in the future, I could see that potentially expanding and uh, sort of bringing that, that scripting layer back in, because that's a, a fun thing to play with. Yes, in the back.
Yeah, the question is, have I thought about integrating the client with, uh, with different backends, like Super Collider? Uh, and that would definitely be a fun thing to play with. That's actually one of the motivations of pulling out just the, play, the, just the playback bit by, by itself. Um, because this, this Kotlin program, it took me you know, maybe a couple weeks to write. It was pretty simple, uh, because all the logic is happening in the client. So um, you know, the interface here is OSC messages. So uh, you know, in the future, I might play around with alternate backends, maybe like a web audio API backend would be fun. You could open up a browser and use that to play music. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, uh, is there a way, or have I thought about ways to write your music in Alda and then export sheet music? Uh, and yes, there is a way. It's, it's not totally great right now, but there is an export mechanism, um, which will, what it actually does is it, um, so there's, a, there's an instance of a, sequ a, a synthesizer and a sequencer inside of the Alda uh, runtime. And as you're, as you're playing your music, it's actually loading up the sequencer with, with music, uh, with MIDI data. And so we're able to export that as a MIDI file. And then from there, uh, a lot of uh, graphical sheet music notation um, programs can import MIDI files. And so you get kind of a, a rough estimation of what the sheet music would look like. It's not perfect because it can't always infer what you meant, um, you know, where you want the bar lines to fall, or uh, you know, what, what, if you want to use a sharp or a flat to represent the same note. So there's still some tweaks to be made, but we're, we've got the, uh, the beginnings of that. Any other questions? Yes? Is Alda V2 available to use right now? Uh, kind of. <laughs> I, I'm doing it sort of in the open. There's a V2 branch of uh, the Alda Lang slash Alda GitHub repo. And um, hopefully the readme is in a somewhat decent shape that you could play around with it if you wanted to. But yeah, it's, not, it's not readily available to download exactly. Any other questions? Well, thanks so much for listening.